Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming to this workshop. Um, I just uh, first want to say that um, I have enjoyed so much being able to work on various podcasts, and that would have been impossible without all the great resources at Joe Larden. And so it's such a, just a real privilege to have such quality um, materials and such great support from the library, and I think that um, that is kind of the hardest part of deciding whether or not you can do a production like that, and so I think we're really fortunate to have those resources on campus. So I'm super grateful to Jalarden, and I'm always happy to support um, these endeavors. So um, you probably are interested in, think, in podcasting because you listen to podcasts. I know that um, probably in a week I listen to between listen to about 10 to 15 different podcasts. Um, I don't like driving, so I walk everywhere. So um, plane rides, all sorts of things. Um, I listen to a lot of podcasts. And I think that what is nice about podcasting is that in a world that feels so kind of fractured and digitally distracting, um, podcasts give an opportunity for people to listen in on a really rich conversation or listen to a story, kind of like when you're a kid, why you liked um, listening to a book being read to you. And so there's something about um, the form that I think is particularly interesting because it's not visual um, and it doesn't have as many interaction points as a Twitter or Facebook, but there's something so deeply engaging about a really good podcast. And so I'm going to talk about um, three different types of podcasting experiences I've had and what they required of me. And um, then... Nico, you'll probably talk about the kind of things that you can do in this building, and then we'll maybe answer questions. So um, in 2016, I started my own podcast called Office Hours, a podcast. And the reason I started this podcast was because um, starting in 2014, I was on the road pretty consistently talking to communities about the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement, the uprising in Ferguson, and various issues around race and social justice. And I spent a lot of time on college campuses. And one of the things that would happen often is that after I would give a lecture, if it was an audience that included students, students would come up to me and say, you know, I, I'm really glad to be at this college. I'm having um, some good experiences, but I really feel like I'm not being seen. A lot of students of color particularly felt like there was this disconnect between who they were and the experience they were having in the classroom. And so what I wanted to do was to provide um, colleagues with a model of how you cultivate a relationship with students that is deep and meaningful and fun and incisive and to think about the things we don't talk about in the classroom. So I started this podcast called Office Hours, where I would interview one student about something that was important to them, something they could tell me about their own lives or their own interests, and that exchange could be a way of thinking about engaging with students. And for students, it allowed them, when they listen in, to think about professors as people, people who have struggled with similar issues, people who are also on a journey. Um, so doing this podcast was really hard because I did not know how to do a podcast. And so um, we had two seasons of, um, of office hours um, that had various topics. And so um, these are all the students I interviewed. Gosh, this was a lot of work. Um, so I had, um, I had one um, student who kind of, one former student who kind of worked as a producer. And we would talk about topics. Um, she would collect the pictures of the interviewees. Um, she created this um, branding of office hours, of like a, kind of a radio microphone um, and different things. She did the website. So one of the things that we had to kind of establish after the show format of us talking together, me interviewing a student, and then we sometimes added an advice segment at the end of the hour. After we understood what the format would be, we knew that that was our template we had to start building around a brand identity. So a logo, a website, um, how people would appear on the site. And so that was probably much harder than the actual podcasting, trying to create something that was visually interesting and made sense. And so um, that kind of groundwork, if you want to do a podcast, if you don't feel like inclined to do that kind of work, 
get someone to help you who knows social media, who knows design, who can help you bring these elements together. The other thing that we had to do is decide what platforms we would be available on. So we started on SoundCloud and iTunes, which are which were very low cost to do, and then Acast, which is another podcast um, platform, approached us to join Acast. And so um, in that process, I learned more and more. But in terms of thinking about the content, if you want to do a podcast that you could see going on, um, you know, until infinity, I really recommend having a template for what the show sounds like. So that when listeners uh, listen to your podcast, they have an expectation of what the format will be, and they know how to kind of interact with the content. And so um, regardless of, again, the topic, people knew there was going to be a little bit of banter between me and Alex, the substantive interview with the student, and then maybe the advice. And one of the things that we, um, I was very careful about, some of these were current Georgetown students, some of these were students I had mentored. Um, this wasn't gotcha journalism. So if they did the interview and then were uncomfortable with it, we could pull the show, and it only happened once. Um, if they were disclosing something that was deeply personal, my, my only request was this was not the first time this information was being disclosed. So one of our episodes was about the criminal justice system, and a young woman who had done the Georgetown Prisons Initiative and really wanted to go um, into law and become a cr criminal defense attorney. Um, her story was that she was a victim of a crime as a child. And she had always thought of the justice system as the hero. And then as she got older and learned about the complicated nature of the justice system, she realized that she wanted to become a criminal defense attorney. Um, the, she was a victim of, a, of a, a sexual crime when she was a child. This was not the first time she was disclosing this or talking about it on this show. This was something that she had been very open about previously. And so those are the types of um, kind of guidelines you have to have for yourself when you're engaging anyone, regardless of your relationship, about the information that's put out there. Um, some of the shows were a little bit more lighthearted. Um, there was uh, an episode we did with the young woman who was a student body president at Howard University. What was it like to go to a historically black college? And we talked about that. So we had a nice mix of topics, and I'm really proud of these conversations because I think that um, making them available to faculty helped them rethink about how they were engaging students and some of the walls we build up, and also just to keep us kind of up to date about what students' lives are like now. Um, so this podcast was listened to by like six people. It was a small project, um, but what I was able to do with this content is it now has become um, the center of some of my faculty trainings around diversity and inclusion. So, um, so I can bring this with me and have clips from the show to provide people an opportunity to learn more. So that is a kind of format that you can do endlessly. This opportunity led to this um, podcast that I worked on um, for four months last year, and it was part of an already established um, podcast called Undisclosed. Undisclosed was created as a response to Serial, which was very popular in 2014, that looked at the wrongful conviction of Adnan Syed. Um, so Undisclosed, after Serial wrapped, was concerned about the ways that that case was presented to the public. And so they decided to start a podcast um, under the leadership of Ravi Chaudhry, who was the advocate for Adnan Syed and his innocence, started a podcast where they presented all of the evidence and some of the malfeasance in that case, and they created a criminal justice podcast that was about wrongful convictions. And so they brought me on to um, a mini arc that they were creating before their season three that looked at the death of Freddie Gray um, and the Baltimore Police Department. Um, so this was an experience where my skills as a historian were contracted in an already existing podcast. And so some of your expertise may land you an opportunity to join an already established format. This is very difficult because the content is driven not necessarily um, solely by your expertise, but by an already existing way of doing things. And so for this one, we did 16 episodes. Um, this is a podcast that was chronologically driven and had to be narratively coherent and involved a team of three other people. So this was very difficult to do. 
um, and it made me long for the days of doing office hours because that was easy. Um, and so we wrote a new script every single week. Um, the scripts were usually prepared by Monday to be recorded on Wednesday. And so this is just a giant Google Doc of new information. And this was also a podcast that as the episodes were being uh, made available to the public, people were contributing information. And so this is what happens sometimes on these real-time um, true crime podcasts. Someone will hear something on an episode and say, wait a second, I was there that day, or the police never interviewed me about this. And that new information may change the content that you present. And so for this podcast, it was really um, my expert as a historian that was most important. So it wasn't so much my voice, but my ability to contextualize um, a wide swath of history. Um, this podcast often was within the top 200 of iTunes. So I went from a podcast that you know six people listen to, where in a week maybe 60,000, 600,000 people listen to this one. Very different experience. Um, for this podcast, it was underwritten by some of the big podcast sponsors, so I had to be comfortable doing advertising um, spots, um, which is sometimes kind of awkward, you know, after, you know, having your elbow patches on and I'm a professor expert, it's like, blue, blue apron, a better way to cook, you know. Um, uh, the one ad that I just passed on, there was an underwear company, I just could not do the ad. I like, did someone else do this ad? I just, I couldn't do it. And so... When you um, are working on a podcast that does have underwriting, that has have sponsorship, these are some of the considerations you have to think about. Um, and then the last kind of podcasting experience um, that I'd like to talk about is just being a guest on an episode of a pretty cool podcast. Um, so I was on, I don't know if this one episode's on here, but um, I was able to be a guest on Call Your Girlfriend. Uh, Call Your Girlfriend is a podcast that has a largely a base of kind of young women um, in their 20s and 30s, and it's two best friends and their conversations every week. Um, this is a very, very good podcast. They do politics, pop culture, um, personal things, and so um, they wanted me to do a segment about the protests at the University of Missouri in 2015. It was a very short segment. Um, this appearance probably has driven the most traffic to my website and my Twitter. Um, my students who never talked to me in class were like, I heard you on Call Your Girlfriend this week. Um, and so this is another, another opportunity um, to do guesting on popular podcasts. And again, sometimes your expertise will be found in a newspaper, over Twitter, and someone will invite you to do their podcast. I highly recommend you do it. Um, at the very least, if you have a new research project, a new book coming out, this is a great opportunity to um, just test out how you sound talking about something. And it and it, sometimes it can open you up to a, a different audience. Um, I've also guested on a podcast um, called uh, These Are Their Stories. It's a podcast about episodes about Law & Order, the TV show. And it's very silly and it's very funny. And it's just something a little lighthearted to do. But one of the things I do think is kind of interesting is if I'm giving a lecture somewhere, one or two people in the audience will say, are you Marsha from Undisclosed? I'm like, yes, that's me. You know, and so these are ways that people are coming closer to your research that is outside of the academy and outside of the traditional teaching. Um, and then just the last thing I would say, if you are interested in doing a podcast that's associated with a body of research you're doing, um, some of these kind of short-run podcasts that go through the material I think are really good. They're not as stressful as doing something that kind of has no end, and they're not as stressful as some of these larger collaborative podcasts. And I think a good example of it was a recent one that Jeffrey Tubin did around his new book about Patty Hearst, and it was called Patty Has a Gun. Now, Jeffrey Tubin had the benefit of a CNN documentary and a book, so you know, we can all be Tubin. But one of the things I liked about what they did was they took the content in the book, they kind of flipped it, and they just made, um, maybe there were like six or seven episodes um, that went into various chapters about the Patty Hearst book. And so this is a really nice way to do kind of a seamless integration of different platforms. Um, I'm currently writing a book right now and there's some material that will not make it into the book. And I think that as a researcher, there's nothing more painful when you have to leave something out. You know, especially as a historian, you have no discipline. You want to bring in every fact. But now that we have these other formats, it's an incredible opportunity to say, okay, I have this research that is not going to fall 
find its way into this book, it's not going to find its way into this article, but what it can do is be maybe a topic for three podcast episodes, and maybe some other, the other material can become part of digital content on a website. And so I think that um, with these tools that are very accessible, we have some really wonderful opportunities to just have conversations in different spaces. Um, and so the final thing I will say is that, um, you know, all of these formats um, kind of expose you to maybe a different audience than, than you're used to um, inside the academy. And for some people that can feel really exciting, some people that can feel really nerve wracking. But um, this is my last editorial comment. Um, but in a time where I think that higher education is really under attack, um, not only the financial resources that go into higher education, but the characterization of higher education as remote and as disconnected from the things that people need, as many opportunities as we have to really demonstrate what our research can do, how we do our research, and why we do our research, I think that we become better advocates for not only our professions, but for um, the world that um, that we inhabit and the things that it can do. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Marsha, for the kind words. What up, Jalardin? <laughs> oh my gosh, saved my life so many times. <laughs> Um, so, I'm Miku, I'm from Gillard, and I uh, want to just talk about some of the resources that we have here to support you if you're interested in creating a podcast. Um, and I have all of this on a handout, which uh, I'll pass around in a little bit. Um, one thing I've put together to help both faculty and students is a podcasting libguide. Um, and this libguide covers the entire process that you would need to think about. Um, from pre-production, so this would be planning and writing for a podcast, um, to recording and editing, to understanding copyright, which Meg has helped me with quite a bit, um, to assessment, this would be if you're actually interested in assigning a podcast as a project for your students, um, and then just some examples of the resources. Uh, so, as Marsha uh, mentioned, uh, especially with Undisclosed, it's in a professional setting, you would be writing scripts for, for a podcast. Uh, so here on the first page, I uh, kind of show a lot of different examples of how that might look. Um, and I'm not going to kind of go into any of this in detail, but it is really important, I've noticed, for faculty and students who are interested as well, to make sure that they have some kind of outline or script before they get started. Uh, because the worst thing is to go out, record a bunch of audio, and then try to stitch that together in post-production. Um, you want to have an idea of what the structure is going to be before you start recording. Then here on the second tab under recording and audio, this is a lot more of the technical details that you would need to know about. Um, and of course, you can actually set up a consultation with us at Gillardin if you wanted to learn this face-to-face, -face, and I can walk through all of this hand, you know, hands-on. Um, but I do have two videos here. Um, I have two videos here, they're about uh, three minutes and then 14 minutes in length that basically cover the, the process that you would need to go through. Um, and it tells you all of the equipment that we have that's available to you to use, um, and also how you would then edit that uh, using GarageBand. Did you use GarageBand when you first started out? Um, I used GarageBand and then I moved to um, Audacity. Audacity, yeah. Um, so there are a number of different uh, applications that you can use if you're interested in editing your audio. Uh, GarageBand is a very popular one, so is Audacity. Um, if you're doing this at the professional level, you're probably using Pro Tools. And then on the side here, you can see popular gear. Um, since this area of podcasting has been growing every semester, we have actually invested a lot in buying new gear for podcasting. Um, so these are some of the newest pieces that we've bought that have, I think, really helped uh, with the quality of the podcast that students and faculty are producing. Um, so all of this can be checked out uh, from Gillardin. And actually, in these videos, I am using the equipment that is featured here. So kind of along that line, let me show you. Um, this is Gillardin's uh, website, and this is the equipment page, and this is all of the audio equipment that we have available. So there's really no need to go out and buy equipment or to ask your department to buy equipment for you. We have a variety of different mics available. Um, 
we have some mixers, we have basic USB mics, which is uh, where a lot of people first start off when they're doing a podcast before they move on to maybe using um, an audio interface like the Scarlett. And then something else that's important to mention is we have spaces for you to use it well, as well. So if you feel as if you don't really have a space that might be soundproof enough or quiet or uh, private, we do have these editing spaces. And the most popular is we have a space called Suite 7, um, which is kind of specifically set up for both music recording and audio recording. Uh, and so you can reserve that space and come into that space and do podcasting. Um, there's also a mic set up in that space. This picture is a little outdated, so don't go off of this picture. Um, and it's actually this particular suite that I'm talking about is bigger, um, and you can fit maybe like three to four people in that space. So it's also, um, I think, would be appropriate for bringing in guests. Um, so you can reserve the spaces and then use the mic in that space and use the Scarlet, which is this audio interface right here. Um, that's already set up for you in that space. If you already have a you know appropriate space in your office, or if you would prefer to do it somewhere else, you can actually check out all of our gear and do your own kind of like mobile um, podcasting setup, which is also a really great option. And you used Suite Seven for was it office hours or was it? Um, I, I, I think for all of them. For all of them. <laughs> Whatever was available, I used. Yeah, I yeah. used every single one. So it's a great space. I mean, I, I will say, like, the biggest issue is probably temperature regulation. So, um, and that's just an issue within the library. Um, so just make sure that you bring a lot of la layers in case it's too hot or too cold. Um, but other than that, I, I, think, I do think it's a really good space to do your audio recording. And just to give you a sense of who might be doing podcasts at the university, we do um, have a showcase of our projects at Gillardin. And so I just pulled up the ones specifically uh, for podcasting. Um, and most of the ones featured here are actually done by students who have produced podcasts for either an assignment or they're interested in just producing their own podcast. Um, but we do have currently uh, Catherine Waldup uh, from MSB who's doing this podcast called Capitalism. And she's working with a producer out of Chicago. Um, so our spaces are being used by a variety of That's all I wanted to talk about about the resources, so I guess open it up to questions for either of us. Try to just take two minutes. Yeah. Just move it up. Okay. The, the other thing I, I want to add, if you are working on a podcast with people who are not in DC with you, you can do that through Skype too. I think that sometimes people are kind of like, if the person's not next to me, can I record? And say, yes, you can. Um, and someone, and to learn to be able to help you yeah. with the Skype and the microphone interface. I have a question. I have Zencaster. I have to pay a monthly fee. Mm -hmm. um, do you sponsor any other besides Skype um, where you can um, do a podcast from a distance with another person? Well, you can actually use Zoom through the university. Okay. And you can, with Zoom, you can take both the video and the audio file. You can download it and then you can just extract the uh, audio file from that okay. and use it. We also have, it's a little old fashioned, but we have a, um, like a phone recording kit uh, that is basically a microphone attached to an earpiece where you can then just hold up your iPhone or your Android to it and record that way. Of course, um, with any podcast, you want to make sure that you're getting consent from the person on the other line and you want to make sure that you record that. Like, is it okay to be recording you for this podcast? I had two questions. Um, did you say what the hours were to be able to use the studio? Oh, the editing studio? Yes. No, sorry. Um, so we're open most days until 8 p.m. Um, and so you can have any of those spaces, including Suite 7, which is the more audio-focused one, for two hours at a time. Um, but if you, have, if you have a need for more, oftentimes you can renew the space and keep it. Um, and some people also can use it overnight. So if you come in, like, say, at 7.30, you could just stay overnight. Okay. And also, what is the, um, I guess you can say, what is the aesthetic like in, like, the room if you want to do, like, video recording, like, a video podcast? Oh, that's a good question. I think it's a little too small in the mm -hmm. room. 
to possibly set up a video camera. Um, because if you have three people in there, you're kind of maxing out the space. Um, I think of all of the rooms, it's our best looking, <laughs> if that helps. Um, but I would just worry about the space in terms of um, where you would place the camera and the, the people that you're interviewing. Okay. What about the video production studio that you have? We have a production studio. It's I, it, I don't think it's as good for oh, okay. audio recording as Suite 7. Um, it has an attached audio room. It's just not ideal. Okay. Um, two questions. So how is the sound quality when you when you take over Skype? Is it like when you're for a listener, is it does it sound really disparate between like the person? Just coming across, you know, Skype from the person. Mm -hmm. It can. I, well, I mean, so when we did Undisclosed, one person was in Baltimore, the producer was in Baltimore, the editor lives in New Hampshire, one person was in Brooklyn, and the other person, like, lived in Airbnbs all over the country. <laughs> um, so, with that being said, you know, our producer worked for NPR. She really knew how to, you know, mix the sound. I don't think it's that bad. Um, the one thing I have noticed, and I was just listening to a podcast yesterday, um, I don't know, no one has figured out how to turn the sound off on Skype notifications when someone is on a podcast. And sometimes you might even hear, even like a really high quality produced one, you'll hear like a ping. And it's just no one knows how to use the Skype function and then turn off Skype notifications. So if someone comes into the like, your contacts, you hear it. Um, I, it, it's not too bad. It's not ideal, of course, but in in post production, there are ways. Um, the, there's a very um, kind of low tech, easy to use one called. Um, it's like an online one where you put in the file and then they mix it based on what kind of sound you want to have. And I can't think of the name of the service. It's like maybe fifteen dollars. Do you know what site I'm talking about? Use $15 it's like fifteen dollars for maybe 30, 40 hours. It's super, super cheap. It's what I first started using just to get the sound levels because I didn't know how to do that. Um, so there are ways of there are ways of smoothing it out. That's what I'll say. And then I had a second question while I'm while I'm talking. Um, I noticed on Office Hours that that the lengths of different podcasts were a very a lot. So um, I think I had maybe assumed that most pod, I've, I've listened to some podcasts, but not a lot, that the episode links would be pretty consistent. But what was your sort of decision-making Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I, I tried, um, so there were two kind of, there are two formats, a regular season, and then we did like a summer school one. Mm -hmm. And the summer school ones tend to be a little shorter because the content was maybe not as heavy. Um, I was a big believer in letting the conversation go where it's going to go. Um, Length disparity doesn't bother me too much, um, but when you are kind of dealing with advertisers and sponsors, you have to be more sensitive to that because, um, you know, most podcast ads should be 60 seconds and you have to factor those in. Um, I, I, think it, I think it makes sense if the content varies enough that a person realizes a serious show will be a little bit longer. Um, but you do want to try to be uniform. I, I mean, I listen to some podcasts where some episodes go almost to two hours. Um, one of the, a very funny one that I listen to is a comedy one where the people are just riffing on each other, but they can sustain two hours. When you first start, I wouldn't be too fixated on a time thing because then you find yourself doing artificial things to try to get to the hour, or you're speeding up a conversation because you're afraid that it's going to go over an hour. So you can you have to just experiment a little bit. Can I ask about copyright and, and incorporating things like music, for example, if you're if you're having a conversation about music, it, what are the rules about playing a clip, for example, like, or, or using a, a clip of music in the opening? Podcast. If it's something that's for not for monetary gain, uh, does that make a difference? Is fair use in play there, for example? Right. Um, I believe so. It's optional to submit your podcast to iTunes, but I think if you want to submit your podcast to iTunes, and correct me if I'm wrong, it can't have any copyrighted material at all. Um, it's it's one of the guidelines, and they have kind of strict guidelines. Um, of course, if you're using just for educational purposes, um, which a lot of the faculty here are. 
um, can certainly use a, a bit of copyrighted music. Um, and I think Meg would be more <laughs> appropriate to talk about this. But um, you can argue that it is fair use, perhaps. Right. Yeah. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm happy to talk to you about that sure. separately if you want to, but basically um, if you are using copyrighted material, it needs to be a fair use, and fair use is for the subjective judgment, which is why iTunes you know, probably just doesn't want to get Sound into too, that. Might have the um, but there are some sites that have free music. I mean, it wouldn't help if you're analyzing a piece of music, yeah. but if you just want an intro or an outro or something, there are places that have a uh, license licensed for that kind of use, but I'm happy to cool. chat with you. Great, thank you. And also, um, so the, the, the Law & Order podcast, they often say that this complies to fair use because it's for criticism, for the purpose of uh, reviewing something, and so is that kind of a murky fair use idea? So you're reviewing the episode, you're not broadcasting the episode? Um, so, in general, um, Criticism, commentary, academic use, research use gives you a, sort of a, a plus for fair use. There's a number of factors that you need to consider. Um, so if you are commenting on something, you need to hear the music to analyze it in content and, and um, understand it. So that is a stronger argument for fair use than it would be if this is a catchy tune and I want people to be you know, in a certain mood when they come into my podcast. So commentary analysis um, is, and, and parody to are sort of favorite uses, but that's only one piece of the fair use question. There are some other um, elements that you need to analyze too. But that is a that is I mean it's sort of like anything you do in academic work when you're anal you're analyzing a picture or a um, piece of art or a piece of music. It's a stronger fair use argument than. Bring more interest to your to your work. Also, I, I, I love that this conversation um, started. Um, there's something there. There's something that I've noticed um, and became an issue um, about when people appear or you appear on a podcast without citation. Citation becomes like kind of a, a another kind of murky area. Um, you know, uh, there was a great piece to yesterday in the Chronicle. Um, about historians, you know, being really uh, kind of more vocal about saying, like, you have to cite our work. History just doesn't kind of appear. And uh, a number of us being really burned by talking to reporters who then kind of basically write down everything we say and then just, you know, can't, does, they don't cite us or our work. Um, and they suggest that um, some, it's, this is particularly um instructive with uh, Georgetown's working group on slavery, that there was this hidden history that was all of a sudden uncovered, but by no humans, right? Like robots one day delivered all this information. So um, I think that if students are doing podcasts as, as projects, really think about ways in the script to incorporate citation as a practice. And um, it can, I've seen some academic situations go really sour when people feel like their work was simply just being, you know, regurgitated on a podcast without citation. And to um, piggyback off of what uh, Meg was talking about earlier about the uh, uh, actually finding music, you can certainly look for music that has a Creative Commons license, for example, or music that's in the public domain. We do have some resources on that guide that I had over. Um, Marsha, thank you so much for uh, the, uh, your commentary on the kind of formatting of the show. But in an interesting way, all of these podcasts look good too, even though, I mean, I know it's audio, but there's a whole visual element that also draws people. What was the process when you were working with whoever that other person was and kind of getting to that look? You know, it's funny. I Aesthetics is not my strong suit. Right. Um, I did, I do have a magazine journalism background, but that's from like the late 90s, <laughs> the magazine sort of thing, right? So, um, so I'm a pretty good... Um, magazine editor for a historian, but um, uh, the person who, who did the, the kind of visual strategy, um, she was she was a, a young professional designer who needed a project for her portfolio, and one of the things I was really impressed by were the kinds of questions she asked me about what I wanted this thing to be. So she said, what are the, you know, what are the feelings you want people to have? 
What do you want to focus on? And I think for me, I was just thinking, well, you know, I'm just sitting and talking to people. But she asked me really good questions about kind of what were the different types of images we wanted to surface. And we experimented with different things. Mm -hmm. um, one season, it looked all the students who appeared on the show looked like they were in a yearbook. And so on the website, it opened up like a yearbook, oh. and you could click on their information. Um, I think moving forward, I wanted it to kind of feel like being inside a faculty member's office. So it's kind of messy. There's a lot of coffee mugs, like kind of that feeling of like that warmth of being in someone's space and being able to share it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that when you think about the visual strategy, you also have to think about what would look good on a phone. On a phone, right. You know, what kind of image would look good on an iPhone. Um, and those are the things that really kind of um, challenge your creativity. Um, and I think that's right. I think you if, you, if you want to invest the time in doing a podcast, spending a little time thinking about the visual strategy is important. Uh, questions about, uh, first, thank you very much. Um, this is enormously helpful to those of us who are working on some of this. Um, about promotion, it, it would seem that after you've gone through all the effort to make these podcasts, that you're presented with the problem of how to get it to people's ears uh, amidst a jumble of literally thousands and thousands of, of podcasts. What sort of things do you use to get it out there, get it separated from other podcasts? Oh, yeah, I mean, that's really... Mm -hmm. So I've heard people, I've heard this, and I don't know if it comes through this, but that before you can like kind of make a case of sponsor, you want to get 50,000 listeners. Now, it's like like magazines, how you actually assess how many people are listening to your podcast mm -hmm. is very tricky. Um, you know, in magazine they say like, you know, one magazine will be read by nine people, and so you can add that into, you know, readership numbers. It's it's a little questionable, but if, if you think, but I think that the external strategy around it, um, being on Twitter, having a solid Facebook uh, Facebook presence, having a website that isn't very complicated, but is clear it's your podcast, there's also going to be a thousand podcasts with the same name as yours. So um, this is why mine's called Office Hours, a podcast, because there are millions of podcasts named Office Hours, right? Um, but also understanding your content is in, in conversation with other things. So when um, the Howard University students um, had occupied the administration building, um, the interview I did with their student body president is maybe a year and a half old, but that was another news hook. So, you know, I tweeted out, you know, want to learn more about the origins of some of the conflicts at Howard? Listen to this conversation I had with this young woman. Or, you know, I did a conversation with a young man whose mom was deported when he was in high school. And so sometimes if, you know, I have relationships with different organizations that are on this issue, like, hey, this is a resource you can use in your organization to have this conversation. So you start to see the content as a way that it it, it ages, right? But it can always kind of re-enter a conversation. Um, and then just tell your friends to listen. Yeah. And, you know, add your listenership numbers that way. Do you ever ask participants, people you've interviewed, to tweet it or put yeah. it on their Facebook? Page? Absolutely. I mean, some of the... One of some of my the students that were the I should they weren't all students at the time, but young people that I've interviewed, um, they have like all sorts of influential networks that I have no access to, and then they share it. Um, I think Twitter is probably the best way to push out um, podcasts. Okay, yeah. Ask a quick follow-up question, but how do you like literally how do you share an episode of your podcast on Twitter? Oh, yeah. So you just go, um, so whatever website is hosting it, um, you can do like a tiny URL. Tiny URL is actually the best thing that's ever happened to humanity. Um, and then, and then I, and that, so what, when tiny URL condenses the URL for something, it makes it ready to put on Twitter in an easier format, right? So, so Twitter allows you to kind of go over, because it'll like go dot, dot, dot. But if you can condense your URL and you can make it available on Twitter, and then you can use a platform, there's several, tweet deck to schedule tweets around your episode so that there's a constant flow of it being sent out there that helps. Um, and then, 
I think you can do that. I don't know if you, how you share off of iTunes, but I think there is a way that you can just mm -hmm. provide a link. And I think it, um, it would also help to have a number of episodes ready to go. Yes. Um, so have some episodes in the bank ready to go, because the worst thing would be to release an episode and then ha have a year go by and have another one. So I'm glad that, really that you brought it up. Yeah. So for office hours, we did all the recording. We did one season in like two weeks of just having this conversation, scheduling them back to back, and then we could take the interview and then drop them in the middle of the advice column and the banter. So yeah, you, you, that, for someone with very limited time, this is how I do it. I just do a bunch of them at the same time. Unfortunately, we couldn't do that for undisclosed, and that's what made it so challenging. I think that's a good thing. Would you be worried that, I guess, the content that you're putting out there at that time is not relevant to what's going on right now? Things are always changing. Things are. So there's a there's another podcast. Um, so some of the people from Undisclosed started a podcast called The Forty Fifth. That's supposed to be about the president. And it, it this is a problem they have every single week, where they either have to delay the day that it's released. Mm -hmm. I really like when a podcast is available on the day they say, like if it's a Monday podcast, I like to get it on Monday at the same time. But for the forty fifth, it's a disaster because. You know, they'll do an episode about the Mueller investigation and half the people have been fired the next day. And so and that's actually, you know, follow the 45th on Twitter, follow that podcast, and you will see the challenges of trying to do a podcast that's tied too much to the news. And that's why an analytic podcast kind of lives longer, because there's some podcasts, the format is such that you can listen to it two or three years later and it's still funny or interesting because it's not <coughs> tethered to things that are rapidly changing. Some of the big news, you know, NPR, um, NBC, their podcasts are simply just a rebroadcast of the material. So it doesn't have to, ha it's not as constrained by time because it's just a rehashing of what they did that day. And so that's how the news people handle that situation. Very little of the kind of podcast that you'll get from CNN or something is original content for the podcast. Uh, Marcia, you do a lot of work with communicating with the public, so you're probably better at this than people who are more used to only writing for a scholarly audience. But what strategies do you use when you're talking about your research to sort of really package it for um, an audience that doesn't have the same history background that um, your academic audience would? You need to explain a lot of things um, and, and explain them in their kind of simplest and clearest form. Um, what, I, what I was doing on Disclosed, um, I, I, the, for instance, we would do an episode, we did an episode about um, some of the conflicting reports about um, the police transport van that picked up Freddie Gray, right? So there was, this, there was a lot of different stories as to what happened in that van. And so when the investigators kind of were going through, you know, this person's testimony was in conflict with this person's testimony, I had to then say, okay, what is the kind of larger historical hook that I want the audience to better understand to think about what, what happened? And so I did a thing on the history of police transport vehicles. Not an expert on that area, but I could explain to people that, you know, um, the ways that this type of transport that was controversial in 2015 actually has a long history. And so what I did is I went on ProQuest and I read a little bit from a news article where people said that, um, so detainees used to be put in a wagon and then everyone could see who was being arrested. And the public felt that that was unfair. And so they had to enclose people. But when you close a person up, now if something happens to them, no one can see it. And so this is how I had to explain that timeline. Um, if I was writing for an academic article, you know, I could say, you know, Foucault talks about the gays, and what does it mean for a person to be disembodied? No one cares. So I have to explain <laughs> that the conversation that people are having today is part of a long conversation, and using kind of newspaper reports and things that are kind of written in this really simple language to jump into the topic. Um, I found it very... Um, I thought it, what I liked about having to do that is that it required a kind of clarity in my own writing that I think when I started working on this book, it reminds me of like, oh, let me be clear 
If someone doesn't know this, what are the things that they absolutely need to know? And it helps with your editing yourself and kind of structuring your argument as clearly as possible when you have to write in that format. Also, no one can see the things that you're talking about. And so I think it really helped me do more descriptive work. You know, like, what does it say? You know, a wagon, what do people need to know about the construction of the wagon to understand why people were concerned about this mode of transportation? And it has to be three minutes. So do either of you have any favorites um, for like podcasts as scholarly communication or as scholarly promotion? Are there any favorites you'd recommend sort of like as an example? Not to put you on the spot. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to think of what I would do. I would say the Patty Hearst one that Jeffrey Tubin did was pretty good because it had a lot of history in it, um, as well as some good analysis. And those episodes were maybe 24 minutes. Um, who else does a really good one? Um, Are you a fan of re uh, revisionist history? You know what? I've heard a few episodes. It's, it's I think it's I think it's pretty okay. Um, Malcolm Gladwell. Yeah, Malcolm, I mean Malcolm Gladwell stuff. I'm always a little like eh, on, but <laughs> I think he's good, he's really good at doing this very thing. I'm trying to think of who's like really scholarly and good on podcasts. Um, Is that contradictory at all? Scholarly and good on a podcast? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, I, again, but I listen to some of these rehabs, like the Frontline podcast, the Frontline audio cast is really good because they do these little edits to try to move from the visual to the audio, and so sometimes they'll pull the audio from the show and then they'll have someone come in like describing the scene or having to add some other content. I'm trying to think. I listen to, I mean, I listen to a lot of like true crime and comedy, so. <laughs> Did you ever listen to The Daily from the New York Times? No, I'm sure that's really good. They're, I don't, it makes me wonder how they get the, resource, the historical audio that they wind up uh, but when they set about to talk about an issue, um, they'll go back to the dawn of time if they have to and, and bring it out with really rich audio um, actuality. To Interesting. There were some short, I mean, I listen to such gruesome stuff, I hate to recommend this. Um, <laughs> there was one that was about. Um, yeah, the Angel one was really good at story. The Atlanta, the Atlanta child murder ones. Um, the content was the 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 host, not my favorite. Um, Payne Lindsay is kind of that one was done, and then they dropped in the host. So their archival stuff was excellent. Um, it was called Atlanta Monster. The archival stuff was good. The interviews were good. The host was terrible because you could tell the host was not interviewing the people giving the content. So someone would say some really profound thing, and then he'd, be, he'd say, that's interesting, tell me more. And then he, like, and you could also, I mean, he, he's also someone that, you know, every, there's like podcaster fights, which is like so sad. But, you know, he's, he's, he's kind of obnoxious, but that one was actually very good in terms of um, the analytic content and the archival material. Um, there was a Charlie Nancy one. I mean, these are the ones I listened to. I'm sorry. Um, that was that was pretty good too. But the Patty Hearst one. Start there, and we'll see. It too. I don't want me to make it seem like a recommendation session, but the, the Crime Town one, the, the one about the Providence. Providence. You know what? That one was a great one. Crime Town. Gimlet Media has some really good content. Crime Town was excellent because they did they did something that was narratively driven, chronological had a lot of local stuff that had to be explained to people if, unless you know you were in a crime family like there were, there's a lot of stuff about the dynamics of a crime family that you just wouldn't know um crime town from gimlet was really good there was one that gimlet did called startup and that one was an interesting one because every season was about a new startup and the first season was actually about them starting this new podcasting company and then the second season was about a dating app and I thought they did a really good job looking at the various issues of getting this dating app off the ground that wasn't just about the app, but was about the fact that it was founded by women and sexism in venture capital funds, um, the issues of race on a dating app. Like they went into all of these levels and there was this one singular thing. 
Um, I thought that one was really well done. Um, who else did some really good stuff? There's one that is called, I think it's called Black in Time, where it's based on objects in the African American History Museum. I think of only been a couple of them. That one's kind of interesting as well. Can I ask you a follow-up uh -huh. to another question that was mm -hmm. So, um, when you're explaining on your podcast, uh, this is kind of based off of the question that mm -hmm. I was asked, do you ever feel like that might alienate your audience? I know, um, for example, on Code Switch, there's always, mm -hmm. they're always talking about like how much should we actually explain because our audience already knows a lot of this. Like, if they're using you know uh, the term like third culture kid. Their audience might know that term, but then they get complaints from other listeners who are like, I don't know what that means. Why don't you explain it? Here's the thing. Everyone hates you when you're on a podcast. That's, I mean, that's, <laughs> a, that's the other thing. Like, be very clear. Um, so some of, it's an interesting thing. So the, what I did on this close was all women. No one likes to listen to women for more than a minute. And the complaints <laughs> about our voices, <gasps> oh, um, we sound like children. Uh, it's, one of our hosts got it worse than, than I did, but, you know... Um, so the, the, the kind of the sexism and the racism that's just kind of, you know, on social media gets projected onto podcasts a lot. So that's that's one thing, like, don't read the comment section. But with that being said, um, I, think there, I think there is a tone thing that you have to be very careful with to say, like, I'm respectfully giving you this information because we're all part of a process. On something that's produced by NPR, I probably wouldn't feel the need to be so instructive. But the audience that we were reaching with Undisclosed were people who were drawn to the idea of true crime, we were going to solve a mystery. Um, these are not people who, on the whole, were reading lots of African American history. That is fine. So, you know, my job was to kind of put Baltimore and Maryland in a context um, by saying, you know, like, I think the strategy there is, hey, you know this thing that you think is interesting in the investigation? It's older than you think. I think that approach as a professional historian is the one that keeps people engaged. Like, oh, this is actually older than you think. Um, that's a little bit more helpful. But I think the, I, I, it's so hard. I think listener feedback is just not helpful because most of it's so vitriolic um, that you really just have to kind of, kind of trust, trust and reflect on it. I think one of the hardest things is to listen to something that you produce. I have, I have never listened to an episode of one this Thank you, Marcia. Thank you so much. I do have some handouts if you are interested in your